The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. I hope you're ready for a very dynamic and interesting conversation on this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. I'm joined by my partner in crime, Drew Meredith, Waddle Partners, but also we're chatting to Craig Ferguson. Craig is a fascinating individual and a fascinating thinker. He takes these macroeconomic problems in his stride and deconstructs them and comes up with theories and strategies to, I guess, make the most of the view that some investors would have on the world. Craig has many years of experience writing letters to institutional investors and investors who allocate large sums of money. We talk about the business that he has, the biggest mistakes, uh, and the, 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 I guess the biggest mistakes that the smartest investors tend to make, the difference between tactical and strategic asset allocation, uh, the type of decision-making process that is required when you think about things like geopolitical risk, currencies, and so on and so forth, Craig is a very illuminating individual, and he comes at investing from a very unique perspective. I think by the end of this conversation, you'll come away thinking, wow, there was so much covered in that very short amount of time. We initially budgeted about 20 minutes for this conversation, but it rolled on a little bit longer because Drew and I just got so much from hearing from Craig. We recorded this while we were in Noosa. Uh, The rain was hitting hard, but it was a great conversation. So I hope you enjoy this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, Talking Macro with Craig Ferguson. Drew, we're back for the Australian Investors Podcast, recording from Noosa. Thanks for having me again. (laughs) Yes. Well, I was forced to, to be honest. (laughs) No, but it's great, mate. It's always a pleasure. Uh, We're joined. Craig Ferguson, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks. Appreciate being here. Yeah, first time on the the podcast. Um, is this your first Inside Network event? It is. Yeah, yeah. Right. come and come to Noosa for it. Welcome. You yeah. thought, well, at this one I may as well. <laughs> Rarefied air, but I came up here for the weather, and uh, we it seems like we brought the rain from Melbourne. Complete opposite. Yeah. 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 Uh, Craig, tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, Drew gave me a spiel coming to today's show. I did a bit of background research. We met by the elevator last night. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do, what you spend your day thinking about. Uh, so Antipodean Capital has been running for about 17 years. So it's a global macro strategy and asset allocation uh, consulting business. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've got about 30 or 35 clients globally uh, from Aussie pension funds, hedge funds, equity and bond fund managers, family offices, charities and advisors. Yep. So combined Funds under management is probably north of five hundred billion, um, but uh, we're pretty quiet. We go under the radar screen, mm. uh, which is fine by me. I write research every day uh, for clients, sit on investment committees, and um, you know tend to do uh, you know, fund manager research, help them with their asset allocation. Mm. Drew says it's um, one of the best. Yeah. Oh, that's. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say so myself, but it's nice to hear other yeah. others uh, you know, talk favourably. Yeah. Um, so, Drew, you've got a bit of an so, icebreaker. I do have an icebreaker. Antipodean Capital, where did the name come from and what does it mean? 
Yeah, so uh, my business partner back and I back in 2005 uh, were, were struggling as every new business does to work out what to call yourselves. And Don't um, call it after yourself. Never no, mind. that's right. <laughs> Ferguson Funds Management is probably not a good idea. But, <laughs> but um, uh, so the antipodes for the Northern Hemisphere countries was, you know, the other side of the earth basically. And, um, you know, we wanted to be known as, as uh, global macro sp specialists, um, mm -hmm. not just globally but also uh, in uh, Australia and New Zealand. So we've got, you know, a, a significant client base in New Zealand as well uh, as what we have in Australia and probably renowned for being, um, you know, good at the local uh, global macro yeah. stuff across, uh, you know, fixed income, equities, currency in particular. Yeah. So you're looking at an advisor's portfolio for their clients and saying, where, where are you overweight? Where are you underweight? Here's my views on where the opportunities are. Yeah, so every month we produce an asset allocation um, you know, suggestion. Like a house view. A house yeah. view uh, for clients. All clients get it. And then the challenge that we have is to make those allocation suggestions meaningful for the client. And probably out of the 35 clients, there's not there, there, there are not two that are yeah. identical. Or different investment they're, policies or... Yeah, they're all different, have completely different biases. Some have a bias towards more unlisted assets, for example. You know, families can often be heavy in venture capital, private equity or infrastructure unlisted. Mm. Don't tend to be as friendly towards bonds, for example, as defensive mechanisms because they tend to have high cash flow. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, and then advisors, for example, tend not to have a lot of unlisted assets, but they tend to have liquidity as a premium. Yeah. Mm. So their portfolios are far more you know, equities, bonds, cash, gold, and alternative assets, I guess. Mm. So, um, so yeah. So we did, we we spend a lot of time with the client, but the it's not so much a case of doing everything that we um, suggest, but it's more about getting the nuggets out, the best, yeah. you know, the gold nuggets out, where you can add the most value and at a particular point, yeah, and meet the client objectives in the same way. Mm. You said um, that you write a daily note. Mm -hmm. What are you looking at every day, and what are you? What are you writing in that? Is you up at four a.m. Yeah, checking the. No, I'm not. Not up. The oh, it depends. Closing. It depends if the Fed. Uh, it's, it's if the Fed meetings are up, and there are eight of eight of them a year. Then I'm definitely normally up at three or four o'clock. But um, hmm. but otherwise, uh, you know, we we provide a macro, um, so a data analysis every day, looking forward, no, not so much looking backwards. Yes, it's what happened last night, but it's more about what's what that's going to mean for portfolios for twelve months at least looking forward mm. uh, and then we do a, a technical and a quantitative piece and then pull it together into strategy so what we normally do on a weekly basis is we'll rotate the themes because our clients are all different you know yeah. some are very interested in equities some in bonds some in currency so we'll rotate the strategy themes uh each day so you know i think um yesterday morning or yesterday morning i i um Oh, actually, yesterday on Sunday. It's Monday today. Uh, when I when I wrote the research for today, um, you know, we were looking at at geopolitical factors, uh, looking at um, you know Russia, looking at uh, China and Taiwan, what that meant for portfolios. The conclusion we had was that you know you want to be owning gold and gold equities and U.S. dollar bonds as the best geopolitical hedge in a portfolio. So we always kind of go down that path. We think of you know the the data you know, the technicals in the market and then think about what it means for a strategy in a portfolio. So we always come up with a specific conclusion. I mm. stupidly started a daily update of my own. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I think it was for you originally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it uh, takes a while. Does, do, you, do you think it helps you pull back from the noise? People would think you're contributing to the noise, but it actually does it help you spend more, you know, direct less time towards it? Yeah, look, the daily probably is more day-to-day, -day, yeah. as it indicates. Um, and as a result of that, the, the tools that we use are writing a monthly asset allocation and a quarterly review. So yeah, the yeah. quarterly is probably a 30 or 35 page yeah. um, piece, which looks at least 12 months ahead at the themes, uh, looks at all asset markets, so directionally says where they're going to go. And that's actually the piece that allows me to move away from the noise that comes in the daily sometimes, yeah. which can often be about, you know, looking at, Short-term events. What, you know, Friday's non-farm payrolls, what that means for pet Fed policy, which is important. Yeah. 
but the quarterly tends to set the scene for you know the next uh, six to twelve months. So that's the really probably the most valuable publication that I produce. If you could describe the market, if I could, Mr. Crew, to ask you, if you could describe it in a sentence, what's going on globally? <laughs> <laughs> or, a par- or a paragraph. <laughs> or a paragraph. We'll give you a few. <laughs> yeah, few probably sentences. a sentence won't do it. I think I just said a sentence. But um, uh, look, I mean, I think um, I think there's a couple of things. The, the first thing is that what we're seeing now, um, you know, two years after the uh, COVID crisis, is is a turning point in markets that is far more significant than what most people think. So. You know, if we go back to, you know, the 19, let's call it 1980, late, early 1980s until 2020, we had a, we've effectively had the easiest um, investing environment, not that we knew it at the the time, (laughs) but with hindsight, you know, the decline in in interest rates has meant that every growth asset's gone up and you've made money on your bond portfolio at the same time. Everyone thought they were, it was Yeah, everyone thought they were genius, but Mm. they weren't. It was just market conditions. Um, what's happened since 2020 is that you've had a combination of factors, um, your fiscal policy being very, very loose, uh, monetary policy being far too loose, and then uh, supply issues that we've seen with Ukraine, food prices, oil prices coming into play. And those three things have been you know, some of the primary reasons why, and I told you it wouldn't take a sentence, might need a few paragraphs, but... They're the primary reasons why inflation's on the rise. Now, I mean, my view is that this decade inflation will trend higher over the course of the decade. So what that probably means is that growth assets, whether it's equities or other things, will probably have lower than normal or lower than average return profiles over the course of the decade. Is that in real terms or? no, No, because inflation is pretty high, right? Yeah. So it says that real returns Potentially are far negative. worse than what yeah. we've seen already yeah. in the equity market in this year. So it, that's in nominal terms. Yeah. So real returns would be much lower. Yeah. They would probably be negative hmm. and could be over the course of the decade. Does that increase the importance of like TAA, active funding alpha rather than just relying on market beta like yeah. we have for 40 years? Yeah, so it means you need to rethink your portfolio for the next 10 years forward. And you can't do that looking back yeah. because the forces that applied looking back are just not relevant now. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things that that does. I mean, it says if markets are going to go sideways for a long period of time, if you just have a passive, and I'm not just saying passive as in using ETFs as opposed to active managers, but I'm saying if you have a passive strategic asset allocation that doesn't move, then depending on where you set that, if you set it at the cycle high, i.e. December 2021, then there's a high chance that you'll probably make no money for a long period of time. Yeah. yeah. But if you're active and you're especially attuned to the macro forces, whether it's policy or whether it's the data cycle, you know, PMI cycles going up and down, things like that, you have a much greater chance to provide alpha. And our... You know, the business um, rationale is to improve portfolios by yep. providing alpha. So certainly I would say that one of the key conclusions of, you know, the change in inflation um, and what that's meant for asset prices is that you don't want to be passive, you want to be active. Yeah. So it might mean you need to take a 12 to 18 months view on whether to own equities or sell them. Hmm. And that's not what most people do. Um, it also means that there are change tax consequences that can happen for that. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's going to be, it's quite a different environment this decade. And I think people are only just getting to understanding that. And how do you view tactical? Where are we talking, you know, 5% shift from SAA, from your strategic asset allocation or 10, 15, 20? Is it intra-asset allocation? Yeah. Uh, look, to be honest, we don't really bother with doing 3 or 5% changes yeah. in TAA because the meat the impact from an SAA benchmark because the impact of a three or five percent change is not meaningful. Yeah. If you if you think of something strongly enough or you've got a, such a strong view that you want to underweight equities, then you might as well do it yeah. in a significant way. 
So I'd be far more biased to being 15 or 20 or 30% underweight equities rather than five. Yeah. Um, but in, in relation to um, TAA, you know, I always kind of think there are three or four forms of alpha. The first is if you understand the macro cycle, uh, and that tends to be, you know, if you think of a purchasing manager's index going up when activity is strong, declining, peaking, and then declining, as it has done this year, yeah. then generally when activity declines, you get slowing profit growth, you get slowing equity markets. So if you if you know, and vice versa, yeah. if you know where the PMI cycle is going, then the likelihood of you being able to overweight or underweight equities and add alpha that way is quite high. Yeah. So that's the first form of alpha. Top down, essentially. Top yeah. down. The second form is using the right instruments in the asset class. Now, sometimes advisors or portfolio, you know, people who are putting together portfolios can use a wrong, you know, a, a particular asset manager who continually underperforms. And it's surprising how often they do. Inertia, yeah. Yeah. And there are a whole range of reasons why they're still alloc- they've still an allocation to a particular fund manager. Um, but generally choosing those fund managers or those ETF portfolio, ETF uh, holdings, for example, that will outperform the benchmark, you know, for example, in this case, the S&P, that's another form of alpha. Mm. So that's the second form. And then the third form typically is around currency, which is something that most people don't just factor. Give up on, yeah. They yeah, give they up because they just think it's too hard. Either unhedged or 50-50, don't yeah. have a view either 50-50s, way. 50-50s, I don't have a, a clue, yeah. right? <laughs> um, unhedged or or fully hedged yep. is, you know, that's the sort of stuff that we tend to do and, and focus on a lot. Yeah. Um, is there a framework for that? Yeah. Look, I mean, what we do with all of our, whether it's the macro cycle or whether it's managers or whether it's currency, we always build frameworks yep. um, to to look at, you know, the 10 or 12 or eight different factors that are important for each of those variables. Yep. We score them. It's pretty simple. You don't have to build a, a complex computer model to do it, but you just need to know what affects the variable yeah, yeah. and then weight it accordingly. And, you know, if you, you know, the lower the score, for example, might be you know, more negative or the higher score might be you know, more positive on the currency, it could be exactly the same on the macro cycle. Yeah. So, you know, either way, you need to build a decision-making framework that's robust, repeatable, and gives you a, a strong signal as to what you need to be doing. Yeah. And if you get that strong signal, then it's much easier for you to make to be for you to be able to underweight or overweight aggressively, and have and a justification with, and with confidence. Yeah, yeah. Mm, definitely. Yeah. How how are you thinking about if you just if we just take a, a broad view here of say just bonds, so duration, um, and then how do you, I guess that's one view. That's one part of this question is like kind of how do you think about that. And then going into 2023, and a similar view for equities. Obviously, we've seen like the emergence of a bear market, right, in equities. So, I guess those are two totally different questions. But how are you seeing things, generally speaking? So, you know, the fixed income side of things is um, it's not really that difficult as long as you can forecast inflation appropriately mm. and what central banks are going to do in response. And again, that requires a different forecast and a different set of um, actions now in this decade than what we've had in the For past three or four. Durations just carried everything. Because pre- well, previously we've had very muted inflation. Yeah. yeah never got above two and a half, three percent Now globally it's, you know, Australia it's six. In the US and Europe it's eight to 12, eight to 10 to 12. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, it was reasonably simple to say that inflation was going to come back and that central banks are going to have to hike rates much uh, in, much faster and in bigger amounts than what we've seen before. So it's not surprising that equity markets have done what they've done. However, um, if you look at the US 10, 10 years getting back towards you know 4%, it's now double the S&P dividend yield. Yeah. Mm. So that's- That's your trigger. That's, that's quite interesting, right? Because it means that a so-called defensive asset, which has had the biggest bear market that it's had in 30 years and therefore gives you yield, is now starting to become more attractive. So, you know, in our suggested portfolios for the last two years, we haven't had any allocation to bonds long duration at all because that was our view. 
mm. then bond yields would rise. Be, central banks be short would floating rate or yeah, we had floating rate like, yeah. and we had private credit. Yep. So private credit, you know, tends to make you somewhere between six and ten percent, depending on the risk level you're looking at. Floating rate bonds probably made you um, very modest single digit returns. Mm. Better than zero. But if you had them unhedged, mm. then Aussie's gone from eighty down to sixty three or sixty four where it is today. Yeah. You make quite a lot on floating rate US dollar bonds. So you actually make quite a lot yeah. on fixed income through mainly currency. So, you know, the interesting thing now is that, you know, with, as I say, the 10 year back above four, it's starting to look attractive and it's looking attractive relative to equities. For equities, you know, the, the real question for investors is nine months into a bear market, is this the dip to buy or are we going to get a normal recession cycle, which normally lasts somewhere between 18 and 24 months? Mm sometimes a bit earlier, but this one probably isn't going to go early. It's probably going to go average or longer. Um, you know, if that's if we're moving into that cycle, then the question is whether equities are going to do what they normally do in a severe recession. And I'm not talking about March. Well, March 2020 was an example of that, minus 37%, yep. top to bottom, but it occurred within one month. Yeah, We're clearly in a, in a longer cycle here. But what should be the decline? the scale of it, probably somewhere between minus 37, which was March 2020, or minus 55, which is how much US equities declined in from yes. 2000 to 03 oh, yep. and 07 to 2009. Yep. Mm. So, you know, the S&P at the moment's down, let's just call it 20, 25% roughly, probably says it's a good chance of going down double that. Mm. And it's probably going to take another nine to 12 months. I kind of see this bond question as well, where it's down 15 to 20% already, but that's because the bond yield's gone from 0.5 to 4. And you think, well, how do you, what's the risk of losing another 15% in bonds? Well, the yield now has to go from what, 4 to 16 to lose the same amount of money again, or 12? Yeah, probably not that much. Probably got to go. <laughs> this is why I'm not, go, I'm not the quad guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably got to go from 4 to 6. Yeah. Maybe a touch above 6. But yeah. But you're right. It's, it's, your probability it, start the, to change. Yeah, it's an appropriate question to ask, which is, you know, how what's the downside from bond for bond portfolios from here? Um, and what's the upside? Yeah. So if we get if we get a recession next year, which I think and Australia might just avoid it, but a global recession in particularly Europe and yeah. the UK looks highly likely. And in the US it looks likely. Uh, if we get that Bond yields normally decline by 200 basis points at least Yeah, in that case. And that's like a 50% return. Yeah. Uh, well, it's less than that. Yeah. But but still, it's it's a significant return profile yeah. for the first time in a while. And if and if the worst case for bonds and inflation and, and interest rates keep going, well, equities are going to probably be a bigger problem, not yeah. Well, that's – so that's that's, <laughs> that's probably – That's a bit pessimistic, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's the, the key factor for the next 12 months is that Equity markets have declined because bond yields have gone higher. Yeah. If bond yields fall, some people say bonds will rally and they go all the way back up to the highs. Now, in the 2000 and 2007 episode, when the Fed started to cut, bonds did ra uh, equities did rally. They rallied 30 or 40%, but then they went down to a new low. Yeah. And the reason they went to a new low was because earnings started to collapse because growth was slow. Yeah. Mm. So... The question going forward for the next nine to 12 months is what drives that next 25% decline in equity markets if bond yields are close to being valued? And the answer has to be earnings. So at the moment in the US, markets are priced for something like between 6 and 8% positive returns this year and the same next year, yet we're looking at a recession next year. Yeah. The normal recession cycle sees an average, it's about something like minus 13, minus 14%, if you look back over the last 70 or 80 years. In earnings. In earnings. Just, yeah. But if you look over the last three or four recessions, which are the most recent, earnings declined by 20% yeah. mm. or a little bit more. So if you've got expectations at plus six or plus seven for this year, and yet in the next 12 months, you're probably going to see earnings decline by somewhere between minus 14 and minus 20 well, it's pretty easy to see how a 25% decline in earnings drives a 25% decline in equity markets. And it does so 
even if that occurs, the PE in the market simply stays where it is now. Yeah. Let alone get cheaper. So it's it, it's not really rocket science at this point. If you you know, if you've got things right in the last twelve months at around inflation, you knew where bond yields were going and you knew where equities were going to go. For the next twelve months, if you get the recession called right, you know where equity earnings are going to go, and you know where bond yields go. Yeah. Mm. So you know, I always say to clients that the, um, the the strongest probability period for forecasting is the next twelve months. It gets harder every year after that. Yeah. Quite quite obviously. Um, so you know, our our outlook for the next twelve months is that bond yield, or in the next two or three months, is that bond yields peak out. So we're actually buying. Returning to your question at the start, we're actually looking at buying duration for mm-hmm. the first time in three years. But we're in underweight equities. So, you know, what does that do with our portfolio? And significantly underweight, like 30% underweight. Mm. So we own virtually none of them. But um, the, the other things in the portfolio are not just bonds. So it's things like cash, mm. gold, uh, gold equities, uh, and a heavy probably the biggest allocation is to alternative assets. So hedge fund managers, yeah. long, short, market neutral, currency managers. Like a fair future fund type trend. approach almost. Well, a bit more active than them because yeah. they've got <laughs> a lot of money to and yeah, it's yeah. tough to move it around. <laughs> There's only right? certain managers they can take. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's but, one of the advantages you get, you know, if you're attuned to these sort of issues, mm-hmm. it's one of the advantages you get from having small size. Yeah. You can move it around. When you're that big, it's tough to move. Mm. But- yeah, generally we would have portfolios that look a lot more like a future fund endowment rather than a retail, a simply six, you know, sixty forty bond mm. equity port or equity bond portfolio is just that. I mean, as I've explained, this decade that's not going to work. Yeah, can I ask a tough question? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I like this. Best and worst tactical calls of your career. Yeah, start look- with the best. <laughs> uh, could, well, you could say the current one <laughs> yeah look the current one's working pretty well um, you know in the in Q4 last year you know all our frameworks were telling us that we were going to get a recession and that was before most had argued it last year yeah uh, so that's probably a pretty good one yeah uh, but it's having short said, equities yeah short, short, e- equities, short equities yeah. short bonds yeah uh, so that's working well um, you know we had a in some ways, these things are kind of like deja vu. If you've been around for long enough and, you know, I had a similar call in 2007 in the US around the housing market yeah. and what that meant and a similar call in 2000 yeah. around tech. So, again, if, if you've kind of been a, You feel like if everyone you're old, else is it. If you're old enough and you <laughs> yeah. can remember, you haven't lost your memory. It's like everyone forgot. Yeah. It's like it, whenever there's a crisis. Yeah, it's like everyone forgot. But if, if you're old enough and you haven't lost your memory, you... You can kind of re- remember the playbook, right? It's like um, lockdowns where we just black out what happened last time. Yeah, so yeah that's right. Um, so so those, they've worked well. Um, you know, currency calls have been important, as I mentioned, because that's a lot of form of alpha. So, yeah. uh, you know, when Aussie was at 80, we, we said it was probably going to go into the low 60s, which is where it roughly is now. So that's yeah. worked well. Um, in the last 12 to 18 months, the call that has been poor from us has been owning uh, EM equities. Mm, me too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we're overweight EM. Uh, they got they got cheap. Yeah. And they were, you know, there was a point there where the S and P PE was at twenty four, EM was at fourteen, and they looked fantastic. There's just no catalyst. There hasn't but, been a catalyst. But then um, other events, you know, in particular geopolitical events in China, uh, and also in Russia, uh, in the last, you know nine to 12 months yeah. have, have continued to weaken that story. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, I think the lesson to take out of that is twofold. The first is when the dollar's strengthening, EM's always going to be toast. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, that's- mm, and that's it's a, never been stronger. That's a pretty key yeah. thing. The second thing is EM can get really cheap. <laughs> and cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, even now, EM's probably on 10 or 11 times. Much cheaper than the S and P, yeah. But EM can often base in a cycle at four or six times PE, yeah. So you, you just need to. Uh, that's 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 a good lesson. Mm. Um, that the cycle doesn't just get cheap and then reverse back up. Yeah. When it's been historically expensive, it always goes to an even cheaper level. 
That's and ultimately, a, it gets to a point where value is restored. That's the key of being a successful investor, though, isn't it? Where you you're able to see your your tactical the decision you made and yeah and, yeah well you have got to be honest yeah and learn from it. No, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine to, it's fine to take the good ones. Yeah, <laughs> we list them pretty. Easy. <laughs> but, yeah, but you've got you've also got to you've got to acknowledge the you know the failures. Yeah, that's how you grow. Well, you said like it's repeatable, right? So you got to be honest about your winners and your losers. That's how you get better. Yeah, and look, the the EM story is really. I mean, I find it really interesting as an analyst. Analyst, but um, you know, it really does highlight the the power of the US dollar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and we're seeing that around the world now. I mean, you know, when the US dollar strengthens, most emerging market currency uh, countries can't fund their debt in local currency. They have to fund in US dollars. So it makes funding it, uh, their, their deficits um, much more expensive. Then when the interest rate on the US dollar goes up, it makes it even more expensive. Um, the, you know, so... And that's what we're seeing globally right at the moment, which is the US dollars in an overshoot period is probably within three months, I think of. It can't, I'm not saying it can't go another five or 10% higher, but it's it's certainly within three or six months of a major peak. Yeah. So ultimately that will probably be good for EM at some stage, but it doesn't mean that in the next three to six months we can't have more crises in EM. Like, ratings and like debt crises. And Sri Lanka yeah. and yeah. you know a bunch of other countries. Mm. So, um, it's EM's going to still have a tough time. Mm. And the other thing also is that, you know, if we look 30 years ago when everyone started talking about the BRIC countries and you had, if you're overweight EM at that point in the 90s into 2007, you made enormous gains. Yeah. But if you've been overweight EM since 2007, which is 15 years, You've just been torched Uninformed, mm. significant. compared to the S and P yeah. or even the ASX. Yeah. So, you know that period of of EM gains has been very very strong because there was a notion that yeah you know, there was a peace dividend, and um, you know from the, the breaking down of the Berlin Wall and perestroika, Russia was coming into the you know the global trading community. So was China with WTO access. Now. If you look at those four BRIC countries, the only ones that really are investable without geopolitical risk are India and Brazil. Yeah. And who would have thought Brazil was a fantastic, mm. <laughs> yeah. safe EM 20 years ago? Yeah. But yeah. The, you know, to be fair, there, there have been significant changes in Brazil in terms of the way it's run, yeah. as there have been in the top five or ten emerging markets outside Russia and China. But you know, if you look at if you look at Russia. You know, Ukraine happened, ETFs or stocks in Russia fell, you know, 9,500% basically, and you still can't get out of them. If something happened in China with Taiwan, what's going to happen there? You're going to see exactly the same trade bans. You're going to see military action in the same way, even if it's inadvertent, if they somehow mistakenly shoot down a plane or ram a boat or something like that. The problem in Taiwan is that neither the US or China appear to be backing off. Yeah. And and ultimately, wars don't always occur because you have a huge invasion like Russia did with Ukraine. They can often be inadvertent events that, yeah, yeah. that simply don't have a catalyst to decompress. Yeah. And neither side are providing that decompression. So it makes it incredibly difficult to be owning Chinese assets at this point because if you're wrong and a geopolitical factor happens and they go down 95%, the risk reward is appalling. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, that's been a, a – I don't think a lot of people understand, you know, that the rule of law, transparency, Western liberal democracies, all those sort of, you know, tenets are pretty important when you're investing. Yeah. But this, this year is probably going to be a, a recognition period for foreign investors and they'll actually sit there and say, you know, ultimately the first thing we should ask ourselves is what is the rule of law like in that country? Mm. Is it a dependable place to be or is it, you know, unfortunately the two countries that are performing the worst are both communist countries. Yeah. Mm. So it's a salutary reminder as to where we should be putting our bickies. 
I think that's something we talked about, like when we just talk about our preference for global equities and getting exposure. We like China. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, but right. like, <laughs> but no, it's true. Like when we we get this question a lot, like, do we want like global market exposure, or just a big basket, or do we want to be more tactile with it? And we probably want that approach. We want to back solid democracies, right, around the world. Well, look, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm a right wing hack or anything like that. No, no. So, Anti communist. I'm certainly but not. But property rights. Capitalism has got to function. Well, ultimately, these things these things are important, and they're important in terms of how you value companies as well. Uh, you know, as to China, I think maybe the best – I think the best way to play accessing China is through unlisted in investments in venture capital and private equity through US vehicles. Hmm. So where US companies are investing in, you know, startups or something like that. And and that, but those startups often have global reach, right? But even those, at least that way, you don't have the equity volatility that you're going to get with listed equities. Mm. You do get it; it's implied, but it's unlisted. Yeah. Uh, but that's still not a a risk free strategy because even those venture capital companies investing in Chinese startups, ultimately, there's a you know, serious risk that those startups won't be around. Mm. If you get a geopolitical event, yeah. so you know it's quite an important factor. Hmm. Greg, we, we said it's going to be twenty minutes. We ended up taking thirty three <laughs> minutes of your time. Oh, sorry about that. No, no, no. We do yeah, yeah, it all the time. We, we aim for half and go for an hour and a half. I'm intrigued. Like I could just listen to you talk about this for a long time. But you know the daily notes. That's is that clients. That's client only. Yeah. 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 Um, if there are wholesale investors listening or institutions listening, they can visit your website, right? Get in touch? Yeah, they can. Do you yeah. tweet? Yeah. No, I don't tweet. I don't tweet either. No. <laughs> <laughs> Try to convince him to tweet. No. 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 Just, just write emails. Maybe next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll put all the links in the show notes so you can get in touch. Um, and yeah, it's clear, clear that you've got a wealth of knowledge on this. So we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today, mate. And That's all right. Out of your... I mean, you could. I, I would say you could be out in the sun, um, <laughs> but look at out there; it's getting darker. worse um, with every passing minute. So, um, no, we really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for sharing some of your wisdom. Happy to happy to have a chat. Thank you. No props. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.